Hey guys, Chris here for Toolman's Guitars and Basses. I have the absolute pleasure to welcome Miles Kennedy on the channel. Miles has a new solo album coming out, which is called The Ides of March. It's gonna be out on May 14th. Check it out. And now, Miles, how are you doing, man? I'm really good, man. I'm better now that you know we're talking, because I think we're gonna talk about guitar stuff, and that always makes me, <laughs> that always makes me happy. <laughs> what, what, what else is there to talk about but guitar? <laughs> So cool. Which might sound weird for those people who mainly know you as a singer. I mean, that's an obvious thing because that's what you mainly do. But you're also a great guitar player and it's not a very well-known fact that you studied music. You were a jazz guy, right? Yeah, I was a, I was a, my, I got my degree in commercial music slash jazz studies. So that was, you know, my, my I think one of my final Pro, uh, projects I had to do to get my degree was to uh, be able to an, arrange uh, a chart for an entire big band. I, I mean, it was like the full on that sort of stuff. Yeah. yeah Mind so. blown. Oh my God. Wow. Maybe one of these days I'll do some big band charts and I couldn't remember. It was 30 years ago. I can't remember any of that stuff. <laughs> I, I know what you mean. I also studied music and studied jazz, but you really don't want me to play jazz standards now. <laughs> but it also changes the way you listen to music right it also changes the way you approach writing music as well and did this really affect your music writing process yeah you know there's that 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 old uh saying you you gotta know the rules before you can break them and you know that was something that initially was kind of a challenge because i was like well i can't go to that change there because that's not that's not diatonic to the key and blah blah exactly. blah blah <laughs> But then I was like, wait a minute here, I got to break these rules. That's the whole point of this. You know, it's like, so it break the status quo. Right. Yeah. So, so, yeah, I mean, it, look, it's been really helpful, though. I think it's it, it, having that understanding, which started really when I was really young. I played trumpet. I was in the, the I was in the, you know, the symphonic band. And then I was I was in the jazz band. And then I, I was the drum major. I was the guy that led the marching band on the football field. And like I was such a music nerd. I was a that you call us. They would call us band geeks. I used to get <laughs> I used to get a, like because I had long hair. I was this little rocker kid and I had a. Uh, uh, I, I probably had one of the first mullets back where we lived here in town uh, because I, I got elected to be the drum. Major. I didn't want to be the drum major. I just wanted to play the trumpet. Right. And they're like, the, some of the parents got together and said, you know, you've, you're, you're representing the school and the band. You know, we'd appreciate it if you look a little more presentable because you, you know, <laughs> look like you play in Def Leppard. <laughs> right. And so, so, so uh, I was like, I'll tell you what, how about we make a deal B business in the front party in the back. So I cut off, you know, I had to <laughs> and so we'd be marching and we'd be doing these like parades and stuff. And there were, I remember once we were at this, this, we're playing some smaller town doing a parade and on the side of the street, were like a bunch of like big, I don't know what they what they were. They were kind of our age, but they clearly had an issue with the fact that this this long hair was leading the marching band. And I start hearing this chant in between our songs, which is "Cut your effing hair, cut your effing hair." Like they had it out. <laughs> so so not not everybody liked the long hair drum major. That's for sure. All right, can we see some pictures of that? <laughs> I'm sure you can find them. Yeah, I look I look ridiculous. <laughs> All right, I have a couple of questions about the new album. The Ides of March, which is not coming out mid-March, <laughs> which is something the title would somehow suggest. It comes out May 14th, right? Correct. Correct. I had a chance to listen to the tracks and I'm already in love. I have a couple of favorite songs already. Uh, what I want to know first is how come the title? I mean, is it because of the historical Roman aspect of it or, or is it more pandemic related? It could be both things. Yeah, it, well, it's it kind of to me that phrase is always, you know, when I hear "Beware the Ides of March," it's got this prophetic, you know, the possibility of what lies around the corner. And when I uh, started writing that song, there was so much uncertainty as to where things might go in the world, and and so it was. I felt like that phrase really captured the essence of that. It just really seemed appropriate. Yeah. 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 My favorite song is Moonshot at the moment. It's Oh cool. Right it's on. Just, it has such an interesting harmony change going on. It I I'm not even sure why, it just hit me right away. But I also have a favorite lick, well r a riff I should say, in Wake Me When It's Over. Oh cool. 
da na na da na na Yeah, yeah, da 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 da. It's just so. Are those octaves? Like da 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 da. Yeah, those are octaves. And so I wrote that uh, one night. Uh, I, I normally I'm not much of a drinker, but I like during the pandemic. Sometimes you just get bored, and so I was like, I'll have a gin and tonic or two. And I'm a lightweight; doesn't take much for me to start feeling yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. I'm sitting there, and I had the guitar tuned. I think in Dad Gad in D A. Yeah, it was like D. Uh, I think I think it was Dad Gad. Yeah, that I used that tuning once in a while, and. Uh, and I just started dun 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 dun, and I was like, "That's kind of cool." And and then I just kept kept rolling with it. You just feel, you kind of feeling the feeling the, the little bit of a buzz, and I was like, it, so it has kind of a party vibe to it, right? Oh, really? It's, Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. It's, it's nasty. That's what I love about it. So that was in Dead Gun. That was okay. in Dead. Yeah. I, I thought like, oh, that might be like a drop D tuning. So I tried it with drop D, and it's a little weird with like the finger positions. Yeah. Right, <laughs> Dad. It's much easier that way, and 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 also you get the, the 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 D and the A string, which used to be the E and the B. But they because they drone, you know, it creates this cool vibe. And so yeah, 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 fantastic. I love it. Love it. Absolutely. All right. There's a quote in In Stride, which uh, grabbed my attention as well. The uh, Don't waste your time living in fear. You gotta take it all in stride. Uh, what what is it like a motto? Of the album, or is it something that would describe how you see this whole situation we all live in? Or, yeah, I mean, I, I, I you can apply it to this situation. You certainly, can, and I also wanted to to have it so it wouldn't have a shelf life, so that it can still apply when all this is over. And it really is the idea. Somebody who grew up and still, I'm getting better as I get older, but dealing with anxiety. You know, anxiety was <laughs> I was always this anxious little I was this anxious little band geek, right? <laughs> So it's so kind of odd in that sense. So I spent my life trying to sort through all of that. There's a line in in Stride in the bridge, which is, um, Wait, why are you wasting all your time commiserating with all the ghosts you never come to find? It's the idea that, you know, you have all these these images and these ghosts and these monsters in your mind that are always running rampant, right? Yeah, but yeah. half the time that, more than half the time, that stuff doesn't ever happen. Yeah. In fact, never happens frankly so i'm like why are you spending so much time obsessing about stuff that doesn't exist yeah. you know so yeah it's such a usual typical thing to be a, a worrier kind of person I, like being worried about too many things i guess yeah and yeah. I, i actually yeah. i was it was so bad when i was in elementary school so i was probably 12 years old and it was the end of the year and everybody's excited about summer and the teacher's like well Today I'm gonna we're gonna do awards for all the students. Everybody's gonna get an award. So my my best friend got like best athlete. My other friend got best student, coolest kid in class, whatever. What does she give me? She gives me the worry wart award. You know, <laughs> <laughs> the only real award I've ever won, by the way. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually pretty mean. <laughs> I gotta say, <laughs> oh, no, traumatize me. Uh, crazy crazy let's talk about less worrying stuff all right. old guitars and old amps i i got a little list here and uh it sort of told me that you were using many old guitars and old amps tally stress 335s uh resonator the national uh, old fender marshall whatever which amps uh i was surprised i'm, I'm really impressed i love these uh these pieces of gear but how come was it the vibe of the album that sort of one of these uh, guitars and amps yeah yeah definitely it was the vibe and also a lot of the songs were written on these guitars you talked about moonshot you know moonshot was written on i have a 1951 i have a no caster like all original no caster and it's like one of my it was a holy grail for me i finally got one and it's the, the beauty of having an instrument like that is it it informs you as a song it's like there are ghosts of songs waiting to come out and i yeah. i really do believe that i wasn't for a long time i didn't jump on the vintage train too much i had a few older acoustic guitars guitars that I thought were, you know, are co cool. And, yeah. but it was never, it never got to this point where it was like, I started kind of collecting some of that stuff. And then when I touched and I, anything that I ever got, I would play it for a long time, making sure that it was going to inform me. Like if it yeah. didn't inspire me, if the neck didn't feel right, or if it didn't sound good, I'm, I wasn't interested because people were like, well, that's a great collector's guitar. You got to buy that guitar. No, because it's not going <laughs> to do my craft any good exactly, so exactly. so yeah it's a big difference between a player's guitar and a collector's guitar sometimes they're the same instrument but in many cases not really true. yeah true. 
through. Oh, what, what can, this is a really weird question. Like, what kind of neck profile do, do you prefer? <laughs> it's just something I want to know. I'm sorry. <laughs> well, I really love, my favorite is probably, so I have a 53 Telecaster Blackguard, and that one's probably my favorite. And I believe it's Tadio. You know, Tadio Gomez did a lot of those necks by hand, and whatever is happening there is just right for my for my hand. It feels just like so good. But that that no caster feels really. I have a, a friend who came over, and that was the, his go to. Once he felt that no caster, he's like, well, that's the one right there. But it's it's a little thicker. Okay. Uh, but uh, yeah, so those older those first few years of tellies I'm, I'm pretty fond of those neck shapes it's interesting how most of these old tellies and also strats had way thinner necks than people would assume like all the custom shops and reissues are like yeah. super chunky and on most of the old guitars i played uh i was like wow this is actually almost like a modern neck but in a different way they feel old but they are very slink and sort of slick yeah. Yeah, well, I will say with my no caster, that one's pretty pretty thick, and the fifty three is a nice combination. But I have a fifty nine Strat that yeah, that one's and what's weird about that one is it's really, you know, kind of tiny down near the nut. But then as you get as you get higher, it gets you know, then it yeah. just opens up and almost to the point where it's like this is hard. <laughs> this is hard. It's hard a handful. To, it's a handful. It's definitely a handful. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's supposed to be something in 59 because like the 59 Esquire Tallies also had like a really thin neck at the uh, first frets and then got like huge yeah, around right. the 12th. Whatever, that's super nerdy. Uh, I'm not sure how many people are interested in this, but <laughs> it's nice to have a fellow Tally and, and sort of old yeah. guitar nerd. Right. <laughs> so cool. Uh, so there, there was also a resonator on this album. Quite a lot of slide playing. That was so refreshing to hear and so nice to hear. Um, is that something that you are obsessed with for a longer time? Or was it like something you sort of got into last, I don't know, years or months? And that's why, you know. The, tel the, the, um, the resonator for me, the fascination with it started about 20 some odd years ago. And, and I was turned on to the resonator like a lot of guys from my generation by Chris Whitley. So Chris Whitley was, you know, the, he was the the guy. And you know what's cool about Chris is it wasn't like guitar. He wasn't like super guitar-y about it where they like, look at my fancy slide. It was more about the songwriting and it was more about being unorthodox and being a true you know, re revolutionary, you know, artist. I mean, in yeah. my opinion, he was su such an, he was as, as important to me as Jeff Buckley was in that, in the nineties. So, so like that was where I discovered it. And I ended up, uh, acquiring my first uh national it was a, like a 1930 31 but it, I, I like it but it's really hard to play okay. it's really it was really difficult so and it sounded it sounds good but it the newer one the newer nationals are really awesome so i started that's what you hear on the record that's like a 2018 oh, national. Right. A current yeah, one. Not a, that's not a vintage instrument and it's it, in my opinion it sounds every bit as good if maybe not better than my old one so wow. i'm a, Man. Yeah, I guess that's the point. That's something that's important to state that not all old gear is best or better than current one. Most likely you will find something that sort of clicks and has something special to it. But, you know, new gear can be as good and sometimes even better depends, I guess. Absolutely. Yeah, that's the thing. I don't want people thinking I'm... Uh, and it sounds like you feel the same way, obviously, you know, oh, if it's not old, it's not good. No, that's not true. There's plenty of amazing instruments out there that um, th that are w definitely worth checking into without a doubt. Yeah, absolutely. Um, one more thing about the songwriting and solo writing in particular. Uh, I love the solos in the album. They, they feel like they're part of the song instead of my moment to shine, you know what I mean? And that's something that I absolutely adore in music. Anyhow, uh, how did you guys approach recording the songs and writing the songs? Was it like a, a studio jam session thing and recorded the songs pretty much together as a band? Or was it like a track by track, sort of, uh, you know, one instrument at a time kind of, kind of recording? Yeah, because, well, this is interesting because I had so much time to write this record during the lockdown. And then I just was like, well, I'm going to demo them too. So I, what I did, I... I was able to kind of flesh out the arrangements in my home studio, program the drums, play, you know, play all the instruments and then hand it to the band and say, this is what I'm thinking when we actually get in the real studio. So this way, 
it was, it was different than the first record because the first record it was like well we, it was more experimenting and building the arrangements in the studio so, so with that said we got to the studio and everybody had their parts sorted and you know and embellished on what I had given them which is great I didn't want them just to play everything exactly as I wrote it and uh, so we there was a live element you know Zia is one of the best drummers in the world in my opinion I mean he really is nobody knows who this guy is and we grew up together and every time I go back and play with him I'm like this guy is so good it's crazy and most of the time he would do his drum takes in one take it would just be like I'm done. You know, it wasn't a bunch of like, we're going to chop things up. It was like, no, that's just a take. You know, he's brilliant. And so, but with that said, then as one guy, you know, obviously I can't play the lap steel that I recorded and the acoustic part and then all that. So you had to go back and, and overdub that. So we'd get that live vibe initially and then go back and I would do the sprinkle the fairy dust. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So you, you were playing all the guitar related stuff like lab steel, resonator, guitars, acoustics, all. Correct. Wow. Okay. So I definitely recommend everyone to check it out who's into Correct. modern, groovy, intelligent blues rock. Wow. Is this something you. you could live with? Yeah, I don't know what it is. It's weird <laughs> to figure out. Initially, we were trying to like figure out what to release it under. Like we talked about do we release this as a blues record and then i thought no because it's there are elements of blues but there are also, there are also rock elements and there's country elements and and i know i have friends who are blues purists and i knew that if we put it out as a blues record i'd be you know it would be i'd be crucified yeah, yeah. <laughs> like no no i'm i'm i'll i'm going to i'm going to leave that to the true blues artists you know but yeah i just like so many different things and for me it's just a chance to blend it all together you know it, it still sounds very much like you so uh That's, I guess, uh, a good, good, uh, you know, a check at the end of the the task. Uh, so, what what were the main guitars? Just moving back to the instrument side, uh, what were the main guitars you were, you were using? Because I kind of hear Tellys, uh, definitely humbucker guitars, Les Paul 335, not sure, um, and the re and the resonator, obviously, and the acoustics. Yeah. Does that so, come any close? Yeah, you are you're dead on. So the the main guitars were. Uh, most all those solos and a lot of the rhythms were done with a, my 58 uh, 335. And that guitar, you know, it's got those original PAFs. There's just something about it. Boy, it's it's got, it's got the mojo, right? Um, so that a lot was done with that. The other was what I, th and this is interesting, and I just found out that that it, it was not, uh, I thought it was a 52 Tele Blackguard. Okay. Turns out it's kind of a combination of there's a, it looks like the neck might be later 60s and we're still trying to figure out exactly what everything is. <laughs> wow. But it's okay because I, I bought it knowing that it was probably like this combination of things, but it just sounds so good. I mean, I don't know what that pickup, what planet that came from, but it <laughs> sounds like even though it's a single coil, it almost sounds like a It sounds like a P90. P90 was, yeah. 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 And, and, and it just screams. So that was that was another guitar I used a lot. As far as acoustic guitars go, um, uh, a 1945 triple O 21 Martin, that, oh. that, that one's really great for the finger style stuff. And then for the strummy stuff, strummy stuff, for the more strummy parts, whatever. Uh, <laughs> Just a mid '60s J50 with Gibson J50, and those if, they're not crazy expensive. And and I really do. Even the, my producer Elvis, he was like he'd never recorded one before. He goes, "That might be one of the best sounding acoustics I've ever recorded." And there's just something about the balance on those, where they have this like really woody vibe and a nice, just a nice top end. So I yeah. I highly recommend you all get on whatever wherever you go to get your guitars and look those up because the snag them while you can. They're good. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I'm trying to think of what else what else I used. There was there was a few. Um, I used a, a newer Les Paul, uh, like a it's like a '57, I think, a reissue that I used on a few, like I think on some lead parts here and there. Now a lot of the lap steel that you hear is uh, is a 1954. It's, it's back here. Some it's back behind me. Oh, I can it, see it. Yeah, yeah. So that's a 1954 Fender lap steel, and oh, uh, I believe the pickup in that is the same pickup that you'll find like in a Nocaster. In a Great, yeah. Pickup. Problem is, is if you put it through an amp and you want it to sustain, have a little gain. Oh, geez, it's noisy. I mean, it was just like, <laughs> oh, gee, that was challenging for for the engineer for sure. Uh, it, it's good as long as the amp is in another room, I guess. You know, <laughs> yeah, that <laughs> helps. <laughs> it really helps. And amp wise, 
amp wise um i discovered the magic the majesty of 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 those mid to late uh, 50s fender deluxes with a 5e3 circuit so i found a 58 that's beat to hell and that's the that is the main amp on on the record uh and occasionally if we'd stereo things uh Elvis had a 1974 Marshall combo that sounded really great. So we used, used those two. Uh, I believe we had a diesel uh, Schmidt in the mix at times, which wow. I love diesel. Yeah, diesels, that's an amp that people don't know about. But that is, in my opinion, one of the coolest amps ever because it's like it's like a Vox AC30 on steroids. Like, ooh. Any steroids, and I recorded with that amp before, and I played live with it. And the engineers always say the same thing: it's like anytime I put that amp on stage, the front of house guy go, you know, if I was playing in a band with a number of guitar players, they'd always be like, "That amp, that's the best sounding amp on that stage." It's just a great, it's just a great um, amp. Um, it's definitely underrated because if you if you think diesel, you think of the Herberts, you think of the VH4, you think of the all the obvious heavy uh, heads, which are absolutely insane. They are but, like, great. Um, that's what I use in Alter Bridge. I use the VH4 and the Herbert. I'm, that's been my go-to for the last 13 years. They're they're brilliant. But but yeah, for this, that seemed to work. I I tried some of those other amps in this context, and it was just just uh, it was a little too. It just didn't quite fit. But but I still you know I adore those amps for sure. Sure. I mean you know there's a tool for pretty much everything. Uh, yeah, yeah. yeah. Fantastic. It's uh, it's it's so cool. I'm really looking forward to um, seeing all the reaction. Uh, to your album, and uh, I'm wishing you all the best possible. <laughs> and uh, do you have any any idea of when live gigs are coming back for you guys, for your solo album or any projects of yours? I we just announced some dates with for for my solo thing here in the states. So we're gonna we're gonna see how that plays out. You know, it's wow. gonna be. Thing. Yeah, we're gonna try and just do like the social distance, be careful, and and uh, uh, we'll, we'll see how it goes. I hope I hope we can get over and cross the pond and play Europe soon because I'm I'm having massive Europe withdrawals. I miss it. I've been, <laughs> this is the longest it's been that I haven't been to Europe in probably 16 years. So I'm kind of wow. like missing it. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Europe misses too. Uh, misses you too. So um, that's gonna be a nice reunion, I guess, <laughs> as soon as that's possible. Tearful for <laughs> Yeah, I mean, uh, there are uh, probably some some tears dropping. I'm I'm pretty sure it's gonna be a nice relief, and we're getting there. I'm sure. So, right. um, Miles, take it easy. Thank you so much for joining us and coming on the channel. And uh, in case you guys missed uh, our Guitar Tech Tips episode with Miles, there's one on the channel. Just uh, go search for the Guitar Tech Tips playlist. You'll see uh, Miles explaining his taste in terms of guitar setups and what he pays attention to, what he doesn't care about, all the fun stuff. So uh, all the nerds, head over to that playlist and uh, you guys take it easy. Miles, thanks again. Right on. Thank it's been you. an absolute pleasure. Definitely. All right. Yeah. Cheers, everyone. Bye, Miles. Bye-bye. <laughs>